Those who are joining us with live stream this morning, we're glad you could be with us. Um, we are, we've had some praise and worship and we've had some prayer intercessory. And so we're going to jump into a message this morning. I'm praying that's going to be a blessing to you. Um, uh, this has been a week of, of a lot of activity, but I had something last week to get ready for this week that I really want to share with you all. And it's going to sound local for us here at DCC, but I pray that it also ministers to, to those who are joining us on live stream. And so I'll, everything's turned on, right? Are we good? Okay, I just want to make sure everything's turned on. So um, if you have your Bibles, you want to turn to us, turn with us to 1 Samuel chapter 22. 1 Samuel chapter 22. And in verse 2, and we've been in this verse now for several weeks, and uh, about the time you think you're going to bring this plane in for a landing, you get something else and you have to pick up and go, go a little bit further. And so I'm not going to put a timetable on this. We're just going to say we're just going to stay with this till, till God says we're done, right? How about that? And not put a timetable on it, okay? So if you want to go ahead and turn there, you can. I've got a couple things I want to share with you before we get to, to um, uh, this verse here in, sec, in 1 Samuel. But um, what I want to share with you is, let me find it on my screen here. Which way are we going? There we are. There's two things I want to share with you that I feel like the Lord gave me specifically, okay? And uh, when God gives me something specific, I really test it and check it out, okay? Because I don't want to just be throwing a bunch of spiritual sounding stuff out there. I want it to be poignant. I want it to be accurate. And he's given me a, two things to share with you that I, um, I don't know that I've ever done this before. This is a little on the strange side for me. So let me just give it to you as God gave it to me. I feel like there's a call for this body to commit to the invitation to go higher. That sounds catchy, right? That sounds really super spiritual, okay? But I think this is what it is. I think God's wanting to call us to go to, to a higher elevation. And what does that mean? I mean, that sounds good. What does it mean to go to a higher level of elevation? If I will commit to the invitation that God's calling us to a higher place, in, in, in spirituality, if you want to call it that, devotional time, if that's what that looks like for you, that, that's okay. But he, I think he's calling us to come up higher, just like Moses went up the mountain, correct? Joshua went halfway up, but the people wouldn't even go up the mountain because they were afraid. So there is a higher elevation we can go to, and as I was studying this out or in, in, in praying over this and meditating on it, it, okay, we can go higher in elevation. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get bigger. Does that make sense? We can have more spiritual authority and remain small. We don't have to grow big, but we can go higher in spiritual authority. In other words, our reach can go further the higher up in spiritual authority we go. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to grow a thousand people. I hope we don't. No, <laughs> That's a lot of folks to take care of, okay? I, I'm just saying. And sometimes we think that our spiritual authority or our maturity is based in numbers, and it's not. It's based in our understanding of spiritual principles and that we can go higher. So we can be, I hate to say it this way, we can almost be stronger, smaller than we can bigger. Because unity is easier with smaller group of people. Is that, you understand what I'm saying? So i got to make sure that I understand what it means when it go, to go higher in elevation. Let me give you, I asked God for a picture of that. What does it mean to go higher? And let me show you what he, he gave me. Okay? There's a ballpark, a, a, a professional ballpark out in Denver, Colorado. Okay? And pitchers hate to pitch there, and hitters love to hit there. Okay? Now, it's the same overall dimensions as most ballparks. So the dimensions of the ballpark is not what's different. The mound is the same height. The baseballs are the same. The bats are the same. But what's different about that ballpark versus all the other, it's higher, higher in elevation. Okay? So you have churches. There are churches all across this country. The ones who are having an effect in this country are the ones who are going committing to the elevation. We sing a lot of the same songs. We do a lot of the same things. We do church, basically the same kind of pattern. But ones who have committed to going to a higher place spiritually 
are the ones that's different. Does that make sense? The higher you go, the further your spiritual reach goes. Okay? I can either fight the skirmishes down here all day long, or I can go to a higher place where I don't have to fight those skirmishes. God fights them for me. Okay, do you see what I'm saying? This is what excited me, okay? Because of the elevation, the ball travels further. The dimensions and everything's the same. But if I commit to the elevation, then guess what happens to me personally? And guess what happens to us as a church as a whole? I'm going to climb the mountain here. I'm going to go higher and higher and higher. I'm going to have, in other words, the world's got less and less of a drag on me the higher I go. The higher a plane goes, the less the effect of gravity has on it. Does that make sense? Why? Because the plane's committed to the altitude. So if I will practice going higher each day, either in my dealings with people, my own situation, my own circumstances, I'll find that the things of this world have less and less of a drag on me. So my word, I feel like that God gave for me, and I want to share it with you, is even though you may be committed to your spirituality, commit to another level. It may be one more step up the mountain. It may be God just lets you run up the mountain to the top and you break free of a lot of things. That's awesome. Okay? So number one, I think he's calling us to a higher level. And I hear people say, well, God, God's always calling us to a high, higher level. Yes, he is. Okay? There's no way around that one. He's always calling us to another place. I think this is a specific word for us during this time, especially through the end of this year. Focus on going to a higher place. Okay, And that means personally, but if I think we do this personally, then when we come together, it's going to be even more powerful. Okay, So that's number one. Number two, pray into it. And what do I mean by that? Okay, here's the instruction God gave me. I'm just going to read it to you, okay? Till the end of the year, press into the change you need brought. I don't like to put time frames on God because I think that's a little bit... You got to be careful with that, okay? But between now and the end of the year, write down some things you need the miracle in or breakthrough in or something you need done, okay? And pray into it. What do I mean by that? You're praying into that. You're speaking into that God's promise over that situation, whether it's health, marriage, relationships, family, whatever it is, write it down and every day commit to it, okay? I think this is the instruction that God's gave me, and I've already wrote some things down, okay? Let me go a little further. Write down the specific thing that you need to turn around in, a breakthrough or a miracle. Pray into it and over these things through the end of the year. That's twofold purpose for that. Number one, we're wanting to see God do something now. But also, how many knows that you pray into your next year with this? So we're not just praying for those things in 2020 to change. We're also praying for 2021. Why is that important? When they did the harvest, okay, they didn't harvest the rest of the field until the harvest was brought into the priest, and he would wave it before the Lord, and he would bless it. Then they would go back and harvest the field. But it wasn't just blessing the field they were harvesting in. It was also praying a blessing on next year's harvest. So the prayers that we're praying now are not just to affect the now. How many knows we probably need to pray into 2021 starting now? That's the instruction God gave me, okay? And I'm very careful about bringing stuff like this out because it's, you know, there's been so much stuff, whatever. So make a list of the things you're going to pray into for now, but also realizing God told me to tell you that not only are you praying for the now, it's prayers going into 2021. Okay, And I'm saying this before the catchphrase that comes up in 2021. How many knows we all have to have a catchphrase for that year, right? Okay, There's going to be heaven 2007. I mean, all kinds of stuff like that. right? Okay, I'm getting to it before someone puts a label on something for 2021. So please, wh wherever you want to put that, write it down in your prayer journal. Wherever you want to put that person's name, situation, circumstance, write it down. And then pray into that every single day specifically now between now and the end of the year. What's that, six weeks? Is it just six weeks still? Yeah, seven? Seven weeks between now and the end of the year. Okay, I mean, that's not a very long time. So really, you get to thinking like that, why not pray into our future 
what we want God to do in that area. Okay, are we okay? All right. So there it is. You judge that. You feel like that's of God. Hang on to it. Grab it. Do it. If you think I'm crazy, then just flush it. Okay? All right. So that's the only way I know how to say that. All right, here we go. 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 2. This is the verse we've been in. And we know that this is David in the cave of Adullam. And this is the group of people God's bringing to him. And these are the conditions they're in. Okay? To start a group. They, I don't believe they came to David to start a, a military movement, but God turned them into a military movement. Okay? There's no guarantee these guys knew anything about battle or guerrilla warfare. But how many knows it says in Psalms 144, it says, I'll train you for battle. I'll train your hands for war. Okay? So I have to be <laughs> tired of being in distress, in debt, and discontented, and let God turn me into a warrior. Okay? That's what the process is here. David's in the cave. These people come to him, and God eventually turns these 400 men into a mighty men of valor. But that was not the intent when it started. It was just to get rid of these conditions right here. So these conditions here can be the motivator, right, to become a warrior. I can either be a victim or I can be a warrior. Yes and amen, Brother Greg. Okay, so we talked about the word distress, what that word meant. It talked about uh, um, the word debt. That word debt, if you read it in the English, it, it sounds like they were in debt and, and were, not, were running from their bills. But in reality, that word debt means those who were empty. Those who had just given it all out. They'd been used up. They were tired and they were ready to find a new direction for their life. This word discontented, we're going to talk about this word today. And we're going to talk about it in the English, and then we're going to talk about it in the Hebrew, okay? So let's move on a little further here. The word discontent in the English, it means dissatisfied, which sounds true, right? We understand that. Displeased, offended, usually used in a negative sense, okay? So that's when you hear about the word discontented. Someone's a discontent. If you've been in church circles for any period of time, you probably have heard this word, right? It means to be discontented. I mean, this is not a real fun place to be. You've been in life where the nothing seems to satisfy. You're dissatisfied with everything. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay? Whether it's the job, whether it's home, whether it's uh, relationships and families, whatever it is, there's a place of dissatisfaction that seems to be everywhere, not just in one spot. Right? But how many knows that discontent in one spot usually ends up being every place else. Discontents very seldom ever stay small. They grow. Okay? And not only that, if you're not discontented or dissatisfied, someone will give you their discontent and their dissatisfaction. It multiplies, doesn't it? The people, that, you know, there's those at the job you know not to hang around because all you're going to hear is, well, oh, so-and-so did this or so-and-so's not working. So-and-so's working and getting more money. And by the time you're done, you may like your job, but by the time you're done, it's like, I don't even want to be here, right? So we got to be careful with this word discontent, okay? Let's go on a little further. Reasons for discontent. Okay, number one, the search for perfection. Nothing will dissatisfy you and discontent you more than trying to be a perfectionist. Boy, I got quiet, Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, the people who are perfectionists are some of the most discontented, dissatisfied people you'll ever be around. Nothing's good enough. Nothing's enough, okay? I mean, you're, you work and you do all your job as best you possibly can. They come in and look at all the work and go, hmm, but you missed this. Wow, okay? Well, thank you for that, all right? But there's this thing that happens inside of perfectionists where I, I want it to be right, and there's nothing wrong with that because there's a difference between excellence and perfection. Excellence has a whole different uh, response to failure than perfection does. Okay? A perfectionist doesn't handle failure or something that doesn't work very well. But people who are shooting for excellence will learn from something, right? And just try to make it better. How many likes to be around those kind of people? Okay? Those are really... So this, this sounds like it's, it's, a, it's okay on the surface, but when you get down to perfectionism, what is it really? It's pride. 
search for perfection is really prideful. Okay? Because how many how many's ever heard this? Nobody's perfect but Jesus. Right? I've heard that, you've probably heard that too. And I've even heard people say, you know, well, Peter walked on water, but he wasn't perfect and walked on water. Think about that one. No one should have been able to be out there with Jesus. If, if they were perfections, perfectionists, they probably could have, but they were flawed individuals, and he got to walk on water as a flawed individual. So that perfection thing kind of goes out the window. Performance base, right? I'm going to perform to perfection. Not really. Not really. It doesn't work that way. Okay? Let's go on to the next one here. Inability to be in control. Wow. This one right here, okay? I'm discontent because I can't control things. No one is a control person in here, right? This control thing manifests itself in different ways, right? Some people, it's very obvious they want to be in control. And some people are a little bit more subtle about it, right? Now, let me say this. This control thing. Some people have an administration gift, right? There's some people you want running the organization, right? They know how to submit to authority. But if, uh, if somebody wants to be in control, that's a whole different motive that's coming to the table. I just want to be in charge. <laughs> Whether they're gifted or talented in that area or not, it doesn't matter. I want to be in charge. What's the root issue of that? Pride. I want to be in control. Especially when people feel like their lives are out of control, they try to find some area to be in control of. Does that make sense? That can show up in eating disorders. It can show up in all kinds of different motives why they want to be in control. Oftentimes it's fear. Sometimes it's pride. Okay? I am not in control of everything. Praise God. Okay? And I've had to learn I don't have to be in control of everything. Well, if I don't, who's going to do it? That's not my choice. That's not my responsibility. Amen? How many ever heard this said, you know, if I'm in the wrong seat, I'm, I'm denying someone the privilege of being there. Right? But sometimes in church, especially small churches, we've done it so long with the same group of people. When new people come, they don't find a spot because we know where the spoons go in what drawer. Right? We know where the plates go, and God forbid someone put the salt shakers in the wrong cabinet. So we got to tell them, hey, new people, the salt shakers go here and bless you with that. Right? I'm just saying. I'm making fun, but you understand what I'm talking about. Being in control. That's one of the reasons why people are discontent. Discontent due to not willing to change or transition. This is big. Okay? I sometimes become discontent, and it's not that anything's going on around me. It's God's calling me to a transition or change, and I'm resisting it, and the secondary consequence is con discontentment. Did I say that right? It makes sense? Okay. It's not that the person's the problem or the job or anything else is really the problem. It's the fact that I'm refusing to change, and it feels like discontentment. See? This will get us in trouble if we don't know which one it is because then I'm making changes based on comfort, not on transitioning to what God wants me to go to. Yes and amen. Brother Greg, I get that, okay? So here's the deal. i got to make sure when God's dealing with me to transition or change and I feel discontented, I don't feel satisfied, my job's good, my family loves me, my faith, I mean, everybody's in good deal with me and I can't figure out why I'm dissatisfied. Has anybody ever been there? I mean, in the natural, you can't find anything wrong. My husband loves me, loves me. my kids are, love me, they're healthy, everybody's healthy, but I can't put my finger on why I feel dissatisfied. Go back and check and see if it's not God when you go to another place. Did I say that right? It sounded right in here. I just want to make sure it got out okay there, okay? So, this is big for us, especially for those who are dedicated to moving forward and transitioning with God. This is big, okay? How many knows God will pull your nest apart to make you uncomfortable enough where you need to move? You, and he says he will do that in the Word, right? The eagles will pull the nest apart. Do they still love the babies? Yes, they love the babies, but they know the baby's got to get out of the nest, and the only way to do that sometimes is through discomfort. 
Amen? And it's not your kids irritating you. It's not your family. It's the fact I simply am not moving on with God, and that produces a discontent and a dissatisfaction in me. And I can't look out here for anything else out there to change. It's me. How many would rather change their circumstances than change themselves? Surely not, right? <laughs> because, because we're okay, right? Everyone else is messed up. You know what I'm saying? Okay. It could be that we're going through this time of not moving with God. It could be that God would allow dissatisfaction to come. Surely our Father would not do that. Let me become a little bit uncomfortable. Amen? He'll do it. He'll do it. He'll See, as long as he, we know He's right here with us, we're pretty bold and we're pretty good. But what happens if God steps back a pace? Just like He'll let you get you on your own for a little bit. And we're going, God, where are you? Well, we don't, we don't understand where he went. And all he's doing is stepping back, so we'll come to him to another place. How many knows you don't play hide-and-seek with your kids or grandkids so that they can never find you? You play hide-and-seek with your kids so that they can find you. You know, a big old guy will get halfway behind the couch, right, with everything sticking out. Oh, you found me, Right? This, <laughs> Grandpa will, right? We'll do all kinds of things for grandkids. The kids, they suffer. But the grandkids, my gosh, we'll do everything for them. But this is kind of the way Father God is. He'll step back and want, he says, I want you, I, I want, I'm hiding so you will find me. I'm not hiding so you can't find me. Are you with me? I'm, I hope I'm getting this out better than, than it sounds. Okay, so that's the word discontent in the natural uh, English version. Look at this word discontent in the Hebrew. Totally different, okay? The discontent in the Hebrew means breathless, a loss for appetite, emotions, or passions. Whole different flip here, okay? Having a loss of one's passions for life. This was the group of people who came to David. They weren't discontent because of, of what was going on out there. These people came because they were just completely out of breath. They... I don't know, there's too many people, at one time or another, you've lost your lust for life. You've lost your passion for life. You just, you're just in a place, maybe you've taken several hits in your life. But this word literally means to have one's breath gone out of them. This is a group of people who came to David. Not that they were discontent necessarily with life. These people have taken some hits. Amen? Let's move on just a little bit further here. Okay? It describes this Hebrew word, someone who can't catch their breath, taking hit after hit, having left them the breath knocked out of them. That's what this word describes here. I've had this happen, and I've also known people who have taken hit after hit after hit, and they just can't, never seem to rebound. Matter of fact, they rebound some, and something else comes along and knocks their feet right back out from under them. How many of those that's serious? Unfortunately, playing sports, I've had the breath knocked out of me on several occasions. Okay? Have you ever been hit, like right here, and your breath goes, huh? All right? I was playing football on a Sunday afternoon outside the high school in Galatia. We did that on Sunday afternoons. We'd go out and beat and bang on each other, right? Play tackle football. I was all about 155 pounds at the time. They hand the ball off to me. I come around the end. One guy hits me and stands me up. The next guy puts his shoulder into me at a full run. And I heard the air leave. Okay? And if you tackled someone, they went to the ground. They just didn't leave you there. Everybody piled on. So I'm here with this football in my solar plex, and I can't breathe. And I'm yelling, get off, but nothing was coming out. That's a horrible place to be because panic sets in that you're never going to get a breath back. Okay? This is hard. The system, your body knows it needs air. And it's trying to suck in air and nothing's going in. That's called being breathless. Okay? What's this COVID doing? It's taking people's breath. They can't get a breath. They can't get... See... Has anybody ever told you just breathe? Okay, there's stress. Hey, just breathe. 
take a deep breath. What does it do? It gets oxygen in to the lungs. It gets oxygen to, the, to, oxygen to, your, to your organs. It gets oxygen to your brain. It's a soothing breath. You just went through, right? Breathe, right? Yeah. And dad's like, all I can do is help you breathe. I can't do anything for you. I can't help you birth this baby, but I can help you breathe, right? And you go through the breathing thing. Why? Because breathing absolutely is important for life physically. It's also the same way spiritually. You know people as well as I do who have taken hit after hit after hit, and they can't seem to get their breath back. It's sad. It's hard. It really is hard. It's almost like, it's almost like you need, they need spiritual CPR. They need the breath put back into them because they're just exhausted. They stay in a place of exhaustion. They stay in a place where they're just drained all the time. These people have taken hit after hit after hit. And they came to a man called David who was going to take them from this condition right here and turn them into a warrior. What a, trans what a transformation, right? But it's no different than when someone comes to church and they have taken hit after hit that week and they come in here and the Holy Spirit breathes life back into them and they walk out of here seeing everything totally different. I pray for that. I want someone who come, has come in here and, and just, they're on their last breath, so to speak. And Holy Spirit, breathe into them. And life comes back into their, their thinking, their attitude, their perspective, because they got a breath of fresh air. See, God knows about this thing about the breath. Because what did he do in the garden? When he shaped man, he breathed the breath of life into him, didn't he? See? The breath. There's a whole teaching on that, by the way, and we don't really have time for that, okay? All right, the abundant life that was promised in the Word for these people seems so far away. Anybody know what I'm talking about with that? I see it on the paper, okay? God, by faith, I know it's there, but it seems like it's an eternity away from me. How many ever put scriptures on the refrigerator and you walk by and go, what was I thinking believing for that? Because those promises sometimes seem an eternity away from us. We need the Holy Spirit to blow back on that again. How do you get a fire to go back up strong again? Give it a breath of fresh air. It'll flame up, won't it? Okay? All right. When you come to the place of distress, empty or out of breath, what do you do? Can I still gasp for breath? I tell you what, I was at Lake Thunderhawk as a teenager, and... Um, we had a friend of mine who didn't swim very well, and he was, we were going to swim from the platform, which was way out. How many members of lakes where you had a platform out, way out somewhere? And so we went out to the diving platform. We were there for a while, and then we went on out to the, the big platform on further out. We were out there for a while. We decided to come in. He says, I don't think I can make it all the way to the shore. And me and my friend said, no, you can make it. You do okay. We'll, we'll take our time. So he jumps in and starts his dog paddling, Okay. He was not raised around water, all right? I learned to swim in the river, okay? And so we're swimming in. About halfway in, he gets tired, and he starts spending more time this way than moving forward. He goes, I can't make it. I can't make it. He goes under, gets a mouthful of water, okay? I grab him by the elbow, and I'm, I'm, we're trying to pull him in, getting closer where he can put his feet down. And I saw the panic hit his eyes. And I knew we were in trouble. He went under again. And there's that place of panic where you don't, you're, I mean, you're scared. And he would grab a hold of my friend and I, and he would push us under trying to stay above water. Well, he had us under the water more than he was, than we were above the water. Now we're getting tired. And, and the lifeguard's sitting listening to her iPod or something. I don't know what she was doing. We got a guy drowning here, okay? But there comes a point when you get so panicky and you become so desperate, you need a breath of fresh air. Why do we have to come to that point? Why do we have to get to this place of discontent? Why do we have to get to this place where all of a sudden we're willing to take a breath of fresh air? It doesn't make sense naturally, but that's what we do. It could be because we're, I don't know, stubborn? 
Let's move on real quickly, okay? How about this? Addicts know they need to get out, but those who have settled or believe they are all right are harder to work with. See, an addict who knows they're an addict knows they can't continue this. But someone who is just in a, I don't know, a survival place, not any worse, but they're definitely not any better, those are harder people to work with. Because on some level, they think they're still in control. They still think they're okay. So until they flip the okay thing, it's hard to help people. Amen? If you've ever helped someone come out of an addiction, one of the first things you've got to do is get them to admit they've got an addiction. Then once they admit they have an addiction, that's the beginning, but that's not the end of it. Right? So the hardest part is to get people to believe they got a problem. That's the reason why when you have an altar call, and you give an altar call, specifically what the Holy Spirit says to pinpoint, and they stand there and they go through the checklist. No, nope, I, didn't, I didn't yell today. I didn't hit my wife today. I didn't kick the dog today. I'm okay. The word okay has, has caused most people to stay in their seats than probably any other excuse. We're not okay. We're just different levels of not okay. Some people are very dysfunctional. Some people are just a little bit dysfunctional. Does that make sense? Let's go on a little further here. You come to a place where your concentration is just to breathe. This is called survival mode. God did not call us just to be in a place of survival. Now, sometimes surviving is a win because you're ready to give up. But that's not where you can't live in the place of just surviving, hoping something will happen. There's something we got to do with that. I love this. You can only fake it till you make it so long. How many, in the word of faith, how many's ever heard that? You confess the right thing. You get up, you do this, you do this, you do this, and you'll get your breakthrough. Sounds good. Sounds spiritual. But how many's ever tried to fake it till you make it and you're done a tired of, you're tired of faking it? I'm tired of it. I need something else. I need something more. Okay? I've spoke the word of faith. I, I've tried to forgive. I've tried to be patient. All those things. I'm tired of faking it. I'm tired of going through the motions of it. I need another level. I need something else. Okay? You cannot fake it till you make it forever. You got to make a change. You got to do something different. What's the old saying? Okay? <laughs> you, <laughs> to do something different, you have to do something different, right? You can't do the same thing and expect a different result. Right? So let's move on a little further here. Okay? Get this. This is a quote. This concentration upon God is strenuous, but everything else has ceased to be so. This was written by, in the book Practicing His Presence by Brother Lawrence. His fight was to stay focused on the presence of God. That was his fight. Then everything else became easy because he fought the fight of staying in presence with God. Nothing else mattered. So can you imagine fighting one fight instead of ten? Can you imagine just saying there's one thing and one thing alone I'm going to do? I'm going to focus on God and walk in His presence every single day. And maybe the wisdom to deal with problems would come from God and not from my own intellect. Maybe it will become His strength instead of mine to get these things done. See how we need to get back in adjustment? We need a higher degree of His presence every single day. I know I say this probably the same thing, but just in different ways over and over and over again. I cannot emphasize it enough. If I practice his presence daily, I would be surprised how much energy I have for other things, how much more wisdom I have to solve problems, how less stressful I will be about all the other things I have to deal with because I will fought one single battle and that was to stay connected with God and go higher with him. That's it. How many would like one fight to fight in your life? Just one. Give me one, okay? Not five things to solve, just one. This is it right here. The one single solitary fight for me is to walk higher and higher in His presence. That's it. But that oftentimes is the last fight we fight. The phone rings, people come by, people call. Sometimes you have to use the word no. 
How many likes to say no? How many don't mind saying no? There's some, uh, no. <laughs> you know, it's just easy. It's almost their first response, right? But other people, it's like, oh, well, maybe I can maybe fit that in. I can maybe try to do this. You understand what I'm talking about? Continuing in a higher level of his presence, eventually things brings you to a place where you cannot do regular well. Being irregular. I'm tired of doing things the regular way. I'm not getting fruit. I'm not getting anything from this. So guess what? You got to step from being irregular to an irregular. It'll work, okay? He will invade your ordinary, and that's what we need. Just invade our ordinary, okay? These groups of, this group of people were ordinary people, and there was a condition that drove them to become irregular. But they accomplished more in three years than the military did. Small group of people, effective, powerful, okay? Let's go on a little further. Did I hit the right button? Example. Let me give you a select example, and we're going to quit, okay? Example of this. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, David incorrectly transports the ark. We know the story, right? He's transporting the ark. He's doing it inappropriately. It's on the cart. It's on the shoulders of the priest, right? Okay? Something happens where Uzzah reaches out his hand to stay the ark. David gets upset, and he parks the ark in the house of Obed-Edom, okay? David put the ark in the house of Obed-Edom for three months. Three months was there, 90 days. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. Sounds like the end of the story, right? Okay, let me give you another, another layer to this. The ark of his presence so impacted the house of, of Obed-Edom that in 1 Chronicles 26, verse 4 and 8, Obed-Edom and all his, and his sons and their sons closed up shop and left with the ark. A 90-day encounter with God's presence, the ark of his presence, affected this man and his sons so much, they left their homes to go be doorkeepers in the tabernacle of David. They altered this family's destiny because of 90 days in the presence of God. And not just to affect Obed-Edom and his sons, if you go read the generations, there's eight generations after Obed-Edom that all became gatekeepers in the house of, of, of David because where else are we going to go? You so infected us with his presence, we can't see the, stand to see that thing leave the house. We're going to go with it. That's powerful to me. Wow. A 90-day encounter with his presence so changed them. It altered not only... The man of the house, it affected his sons after that. The, in other words, I'm not going to stand here at the door and watch that, that box leave here. I'm going to go after it. This is huge. It not only affected him, but the sons and the sons after that. They laid down their whole lifestyle because of a 90-day encounter with the presence of God. His sweet presence changes everything. You can, read, you can read books on religion. You can read books on different religions around, throughout the world. None of them promise his presence. None. And not only did he promise to be with us, he promised to be in us. I connect to that and all my stresses go away for everything else I have to go do. Single, solitary fight connected to his presence how simple is that but how complicated do we make it the presence of God will change your life I love the word I love teaching the word I'd like to see all the things I've never seen before but when you can step into his presence how many knows God already knows the Greek and the Hebrew He's not impressed with that. But just to be in his presence. As a father, what greater thing is there for a father to hang out with their kids and then their grandkids? That's the blessing when you get to a certain age. You know you're older when all you want for your birthday is just to hang out with your kids. You know what I'm saying? 
What can we get you for your birthday? What can we get you for, your, for Christmas? Oh, let's all of us just be together. It's not when you're getting old. <laughs> when that's all you want is their presence. You don't have to gift wrap me anything. I just want to be in the, I don't want to be in the living room floor with you. That's all I want to be. We understand this in the natural. I think God's calling us to a higher place in the spiritual realm. Seek his presence. Seek him first. First things first. Write down what you want to see God do at the, towards the end of this year. Write it down. Commune with that, with faith and with God. See him working it out. See him doing it because you've committed it to him. And I think that is a pole vault into the next year. That's what the Jews did. It wasn't just a blessing on the harvest. It was a blessing for the next, next year. That's what the Jewish New Year is all about. Thanking God for what's happened, but also putting blessing into the next year. Why not? What do you got to look forward to, to, to in 2021? It can't be political, right? <laughs> okay. But there's some things for the kingdom in 2021 we want to see happen. Me personally, family, church, across the board. Let's stand up this morning, please. Thank you, Father. So the instruction is what? Write it down. Get it down on the paper. Get it down in your prayer journal. Get it written down. Look at it. Pray into it. Get you a scripture that goes along with that, that, that situation and pray the word over that. You're investing the word of God into that situation. Amen? Do that, those who will. Next thing is respond to the invitation. How many of you have ever gotten an invitation from something and you think, well, if I don't show up, they know I didn't. If I don't come, they know I didn't. How many of you ever sends an uh, was it RSVP? Is that what it's called? How many does that? Okay, you, perf you perfect people do that. Respond to the invitation. He's, I, I hear God whispering, come here, come on up, come here. But it's steeper towards the top, right? He's up there going, come on up, come on, just one more step. One more step. He's got so much for us. So much for us. But he's wanting us to come one more step. He's stepping away and saying, come one more step up. Just one more step. See what happens. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, for those who have an ear, let us hear what the Spirit of God is saying. I hear the call so clearly. Come one more step. Just come one more step up. If we be honest with God, there's so many things we try to do in the natural. We try to do it in our own physical strength. We try to do it by our own uh, just determination. Sometimes we try to accomplish things in our own stubbornness. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's still the basis is me, it's self. It's not allowing him to do it. So for those this morning, if there's anybody here or joining us on live stream, you're at a place where you're breathless. You've taken hit after hit after hit. You've had family things hit you. You've had financial things hit you. You are just, I'm out of breath. I've gone as long and as hard as I know how to go. And I'm sucking for air because I can't seem to get enough breath in me. We carry more load than we're supposed to. It doesn't start out with a lot of weight. It starts out with a pound at a time, a pound at a time. And before we know it, our endurance is gone. I'm just speaking from experience, okay? It's one thing to have gotten to that place. It's another, another thing to stay there. But we can fake it till we make it. We can put the smile on. 
People ask you, do you love God? Oh, yeah, I love God. We can have the church sayings. We know how to do the church cliches and all those things like that. But inside, we're breathless. And we need a breath of fresh air. We need God to blow on some things. Amen? I've had the unfortunate experience of doing CPR a couple times. And not once did anybody refuse my CPR. <laughs> if you can't breathe, you will accept breath. So put yourself in a position to receive. Father, blow the breath in me. Breathe life into me. All those areas. Holy Spirit, just blow on us this morning. Breathe into us. Fresh breath. So if that's you this morning, just put yourself in a position to receive that. Ask the Holy Spirit, breathe into me. Give me a breath. Everybody do this with me. Take a deep breath. If that felt good, do it again. Calm your mind. Calm the emotions. Just take him in. You're not just breathing oxygen, you're breathing him. Let all the stress go. I've got him. There's not another thing I need except him. Praise God. We're going to say goodbye to our online live stream. We thank you for joining us, and we'll, we'll, we'll see you next week.